Welcome to episode 31. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. The holiday season is upon us, and there is no time like the present to book your holiday getaway with 3D Travel Company. Whether you want to set sail on the high seas or visit exotic and foreign locales, maybe your dream is to see a magical mouse, or maybe you long for a getaway that will universally appeal to all. For a limited time, my listeners receive a Disney gift card with qualifying Disney vacation purchases booked and traveled by the end of 2016. For more information on booking any of these trips, go to 3dtravelcompany.com and tell them Trenton sent you. Merry Christmas and welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest is fond of playing video games, is always being told by his mom to clean his room. His name is Kevin Keen, a.k.a. Captain N. What? How did we get here? Simon Belmont? Kid Icarus? Mega Man? And you must be Captain N. <laughs> you guys aren't real. You're just so many computer huh? bites in my game cartridges. Wow, they're real. Today's special guest has come all the way from Cybertron. Welcome Ironhide to the show. So, anyone else? Yeah, I'll go again. I'm ready whenever you are. <laughs> I like you, Ironhide. You remind me a lot of Hotshot. You... you really think so, sir? All right, that's enough training for today, men. We'll pick this up tomorrow. Sir! Oh, wow. Can't believe Optimus said that. Just to be mentioned in the same breath as Hotshot is probably the greatest compliment in the universe. Our special guest is also one that loves to play in the sewers, gets people shell-shocked, and loves pizza. Please welcome Raphael to the show. Oh, man, not again. Do the words get a life mean anything to you losers? Okay, let's do it. But I'm telling you, any of you chumps put a scratch on my bike, you're footing the bill. Get it? Footing the bill? Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have Matt Hill. Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Brenton, my friend, it is so awesome to uh, be invited and uh, to be on your Who Did That Voice? Because um, I'm always wondering, too. It's like, hey, who did that voice? You know, and so um, it's, uh, I think it's a, a brilliant idea, man. So uh, it, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, thanks so much, Matt. I, uh, you know, I grew up knowing you without knowing you, and now it's a, it's a pleasure to get to actually meet you and, and talk with you and uh, learn a little bit more about you today. Absolutely, man. The pleasure is all mine too, dude. You know, Matt, the very first thing we always like to do is just kind of get a brief story on who our guest is and how did you get into the voiceover industry? Well, that's a, that's a great question, man. It's, um, you know, I call it kind of like my 13-year-old self. Um, I kind of had one of those moments, you know, um, when, I don't know, I, I, I think in some respects, I'd always been, you know, preparing for that kind of light bulb moment at 13, you know, on all the, the sort of stages of my, of my younger days, you know, at the bottom of my cul-de-sac where, you know, we always used to call it monkey hour and we would, you know, literally we'd put on shows and, you know, do this stuff and I'd be dancing and singing and, you know, having fun. And, you know, it was kind of like those moments then I think led to that, that big one, you know, when I turned 13, I just went, wow. I've been thinking about this for a long time. And, you know, in my brain, I'm thinking like, okay, 13 years have gone through the candles here on my storybook. If that's what I want to do, then this is what I'm going to do. And I even skipped school that day. And I say sorry to all my teachers uh, because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, really, it's the truth. I was on a mission. I said, you know, today's the day. I'm going to I'm gonna make this happen. And it, I, I call it now, actually, I took a, my very first professional development day from school. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and um, but they did. I, I took the bus downtown and I walked into an agency that I'd heard um, on the radio. And this chain smoking ex model named Dorothy Boyce, God love her, 
Um, you know, she looked over through the haze and, you know, she's like, Hey, who are you? You know, I'm like, Oh, Hey, I'm Matt Hill. It's nice to meet you. And she's like, what are you doing here? And I'm, I'm like, I want to be an actor. And she's like, you got any experience? I'm like, Nope, I have no experience, but I really want to do this, you know? And she kind of looked me, give me the once over and said, you know, I, maybe I'm crazy, but I don't know why I'm doing this, but I, I got a feeling about you kid. And, um, you know, she signed me up for my first, uh, course and, I think what about two or three weeks after I finished that, I got my first gig, and that was playing um, Santa's elf in the Christmas Day parade at uh, you know up here in Vancouver, and you know <laughs> so two weeks made more money than I'd ever made in my paper route for you know my whole life, and uh, it it, it kind of really just set it going, you know. Well, that is most fascinating. I didn't know you played a Christmas elf. <laughs> yeah. I had to, it got me, it's funny, without even realizing it, I was already getting into voiceover. So, you know, <laughs> I thought it was just because I was short and I fit the suit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, you know, when it comes to animation, was Captain In your very first show? Very, yes, very first show professionally where, like, you know, I became a card-carrying union member, I think, three episodes in. And so that was really the one that kick-started it all. Um, and it's kind of cool because that was actually – a, kind of officially one of the first big sort of American cartoon, you know, Saturday morning cartoon series um, that came to record in Vancouver. So it was a really neat time to get in. Um, you know, and honestly, did I know that that would be, you know, sort of the, la the launching point for, you know, almost 30 years now and doing voiceover and, you know, film and TV and, and all that. I mean, you know, it's quite amazing, you know, to know that that was kind of like, the, that was it, that kind of, that, set it all in motion, you know? Absolutely. You know, and I kind of jumped into that question without really telling my listeners who you played. And you did play Kevin Keen, who was Captain in the Game Master on Captain in the Game Master uh, animated show from back in the 80s. And uh, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, your very first animation, that's always where we like to start at the very beginning. It's a good place to start. <laughs> it always is. You know, it's so funny. I was making the greatest hits, um, you know, the sort of, of, of like all my cartoon shows and stuff. And, uh, you know, I actually came across some old Captain Nintendo footage. And so I tried to piece some together. And, oh, man. All I could say is, thank God I've improved. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was horrible. <laughs> Were you the actual boy that was live action before it became animated, or were you just the voice? No. Okay. No, I was just no, I just just the voice. No, I had blonde curly hair and looked like sort of like a shorter version of you know Sammy Hagar mixed with Brian Adams. So you know, <laughs> um, but uh, you know the other guy they at the time they they were thinking they might want to do you know both like the same guy, but um, then they split us up. So. Hey, at least you were a part of that because I know it's a show that I grew up loving <laughs> Captain N, the Game Master show, because it was so fascinating because I loved video games and I loved the original Nintendo. So Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It's got uh, quite an ardent, uh, you know, fan base. And like you, like you said, it kind of hit everything at the right time, I guess. Yeah, most definitely. Well, you know, another amazing show that you got to be a part of was Saban's Ninja Turtles, The Next Mutation. And you got to play Raphael in that show, the TV show, live action show. And uh, when you played Raph, were you just the voice in that or did you actually wear the turtle suit as well? Oh, yeah. No, actually, uh, playing Raphael, you know, just a little bit from my brothers and sisters out there, Calabonga. Um, I actually was cast originally uh, in 92 to be Raphael inside the suit for Turtle 3. Turtle, I think it was called Turtles Back in Time. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so it was great because I got to use all my athletics and, you know, train with a world-class martial artist, actually, a gentleman by the name of um, Shashir Inakalia, who's, a, I think, is an eighth-degree black belt master in um, our niece, which is Filipino stick fighting. And he actually was the uh, stunt guy, the, well, the martial artist for Michelangelo. And so when when I got cast for the role, you know, they said, well, you know, um, we're going to be doing also parts of the kicks and the punches and things like that in between the lines. So they wanted us to train for, I guess I like, trained for about nine months, you know, to get ready for like the hottest, heaviest, most like, you know, blinding bit of acting work that I had done to date. You know, it was kind of like Kabuki theater. It was really, it was acting blind, deaf and dumb. <laughs> Wow. So you said you were actually in Turtles 3 as well as the TV show? Yeah. Yeah. So then, so Turtles 3, the movie, we did that in 92 and it came out in 93. And then I believe then Saban came calling, I think, what was the year when that was done? Like 97? It was like 97. Yeah. Because it was like Power Rangers yeah. in space. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So they wanted me to play Raph. They wanted me to get back inside the suit. Well, they, yeah, they, want, they just said, would you like to get back in the suit? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and, and it was awesome being in the suit. Obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty. 
you know, at that point I was like, ah, you know what, I've only, I've done it once, so I'm good there. And um, so then they came back and said, hey, would you like to read for, you know, to play him then as the, you know, doing the voice. And I was like, oh, that would be amazing. Because, you know, um, instead of having to spend three hours getting into the turtle suit every day and, you know, um, <laughs> like it's hot, it's heavy, it, it was great. Um, I All I had to do was turn my hat on backwards and go in the studio and, you know, voice <laughs> this guy you know, who I felt quite a kinship with, you know, and so I thought that was, for me, it was kind of like a, it, it was a big gift because it, it sort of, I think, helped me and Raphael kind of like become one, you know, um, so it was, it was a lot of fun doing all those episodes. Well, that is most fascinating. I didn't realize that you were both, you know, in the live action movie and the series. I knew you were in the series, but that's fascinating yeah. that you got to play both of those. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. That's for sure. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. That was definitely one of my favorites. Saban did so many amazing shows, and the fact that they brought Turtles to a live action TV show was just amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, no kidding. And actually, on a you know on a, on a budget that was kind of a shoestring too. So, you know, hats off to all the the cast and crew up here in Vancouver because boy, I tell you, you know, um, they they made it look pretty good. Yeah, they did an amazing job with the limited budget they had. Honestly, it was really good. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, Matt, there's another big character that you have played that a lot of people know from Cartoon Network. You played Ed with 1D on Ed, Ed, and Eddie. What was it like for you playing on that show with that cast of, of guys? I, I played Ed with 1D. Wow. <laughs> I, did, I, did you, I didn't know that. That is, uh, wow. Well, thank you very much for that, Trenton, because uh, playing Ed single D for eight seasons was so much fun. It was sparkly, and we had the best time ever. <laughs> and, um, you know, what? it's funny, it, it was kind of, vocally, it was probably one of the hardest shows that I ever did um, because, in a way, um, the creator of it, um, Danny Antonucci, was such a, but he was a brilliant, he was a genius. He had all the storyboards in his head, so he knew how he wanted every scene to be done, and you know, he wouldn't let us not keep doing the lines until he got what he needed. So, you know, I think, I think at one point I set a record for like, you know, 30, 36 takes or something for one line. And, <laughs> wow. you know, um, you know, but the thing is cool is that in, in all the cartoons that I've done, I, we never did any pickups on that show, which is usually you come back later and, you know, if a scene doesn't work or if the writing was a bit long or if it, they needed more material, you know, you'd fix it in post, right? Yeah. And um, that was the only show that literally the only time we came back to do something different was if the broadcaster said, hey, you know, you can't say that. We need to say this. Um, so I have a lot of respect for that. And, uh, you know, as all the Eds always say, going, wow, we earned our bucks on that show because we worked our proverbial, you know, what's off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's awesome, man. I didn't realize, you know, because a lot of times they do do the retakes. And so for them to just say, hey, we're going to do it here and now and here, that's amazing, you know. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, and I, like I said, I have, I have so much respect for, for Danny, the creator, and, you know, the whole team because uh, it really was, you know, it's funny looking back on it now. It, it, it's one of those shows that just kind of comes along and, man, it just, it just hit. You know, and, you know, like when we went on our uh, our run around North America, which um, I, I have a feeling you might ask about later, you know, it really allowed that character, interestingly enough, to come to life again. Actually, specifically Raphael and, and Ed, you know, with meeting all the kids that we spoke to at all the school presentations. You know, and again, the greatest gift because they're all coming at me going, oh, my God, I love you in that show. And, you know, it, 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 but it literally helped us spread our message, which was, you know, spreading environmental action. Absolutely. So it gave you an in for the kids and then it was giving you an opportunity to share other wonderful things with them at the same time. Yeah. You know, it, it really, it gave us the, it was like a connection point, right? It's like yeah. what you said when you introduced yourself um, by email, you're like, oh man, you know, I, I grew up with you, but I just didn't know it was you, you know, and, <laughs> and um and that was the brilliant gift for both sides, myself and everyone I ran to, ran into, <laughs> pardon the pun, <laughs> on the tour. Um, you know, was was people going, you know, you really like from like from the young kids all the way up to like adults who turned into ten year olds, you know, when they found out I was Raphael, you know. I mean, um, you know, I remember one principal actually um coming to me in a school in Houston and you know, he was a big, tall African American man and you know, had run the school like a, you know, really like a military college. And so, you know, for this man to come up to me after our presentation with a tear in his eye and say, hey, man, I just wanted to thank you for being 
Raphael and all the other voices that, um, you know, now I know my kids are, are listening to, um, like, you know, Ed and, and My Little Pony and, and um, what do they call it, uh, Care Bears. You know, he said, but I want you to know that when I was a kid, I went through such a tough childhood because he said, you know, my dad wasn't the nicest man. And um, he had a tear in his eye and he just said, I want you to thank, I want to thank you because Raphael in this moment made such a difference in my life because it helped me believe in myself. It helped me see that, you know, someone else could be a bit of an outcast, but he still wore his heart on his sleeve. You know, he still helped old ladies across the street. He just didn't tell anybody about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I had these like unbelievable moments of humanity that, you know, like I said, people were thanking me and I'm looking at them going, whoa, dude, thank you for giving me such a great life too. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, such a win-win. So feel very, <laughs> very fortunate. That's, that's an amazing story. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you also became a part of a show that has a long running and a long fan base. You got to play on both Transformers Armada and Transformers Energon uh, as Carlos initially, and then you returned as Carlos in Energon, and you got to play Ironhide. What was it like playing that character? Oh, uh, Ironhide? Yeah. He's, he's kind of like he's kind of like Raphael and, and like Ed and, um, you know, another guy I'm playing right now on a DreamWorks show called Dino Trucks. They're, it's kind of like everything all together because Ironhide was like over the top and just like, you know, but again, did everything for the team. Like he, you know, wore his heart on his sleeve, but he'd be the first one to, you know, jump in and be like, oh, I'm going to kick your guy's ass. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if it's art imitating life or what, you know, I'm, you know, what I'm saying. Well, Transformers has been a long-running show that I've been a follower of since I was a kid, you know, growing up oh, in, nice. in the 80s and 90s. So being yeah. able to speak with you is, is very fascinating because Transformers has been a show that, you know, like other shows, like the Turtles and everything you've done, it's impacted a lot of people in different ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, uh, and that's why, you know, really, it's funny, I was always uber grateful for the life that, you know, film and TV and cartoons especially had given me because, you know, it obviously, I got to go and have fun and, you know, and, and got really, you know, nicely well paid when I was doing it. So I was always really grateful for what I, what, what, you know, what I was putting in, I was getting, um, I was receiving back, but it wasn't, like I said, until I went out on the tour that it came for like 20 full back to me as a gift of going, Oh, wow look at all the people that are saying that they helped me with, you know, through this childhood or they just helped me have a laugh or they just helped me believe in myself or, you know, um, like you said, it's like getting, getting to hear all these different characters that I feel I got chosen to play, you know, which even other people have played them as well. It's almost like just becoming, getting to become this version of, I guess the, you know, the story on the characters, you know? Yeah, most definitely. Absolutely. It's just amazing, you know, to be a part of these legacies of shows that have impacted people and to continue impacting people yeah. as the eras and times go on, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, cause I, I still speak to kids and, um, you know, doing keynotes and, you know, I, I did a bunch this July and same thing, you know, the leadership camp and it's so neat. These kids were coming from around the world. So again, when they find out all these different ones, I guess, you know, their eyes light up for, for one because they didn't know the other one, but they are like, Oh my God, you're on this one. You know? And so it's so <laughs> neat to have this international audience too, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's like now I, now I feel inspired for the next part of it because every time I get a gig, it allows me to stay current with the kids, you know? And also at the same time, I, you know, I get to keep, um, you know, gainfully employed. So it's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Well, you know, earlier you were mentioning Care Bears and uh, you played Tenderheart Bear, which he was absolutely one of my favorite characters growing up. Uh, one of the best Care Bears, in my opinion. And you've also played on Street Sharks as Jab, which those shows were both childhood favorites of mine. So, yes. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah, playing Care Bears is like one of my favorite things. I love doing this with, you know, with the kids. Well, or if I have a, a, you know, a group of older uh, older people. Now I'll be like, okay, everybody, everybody remember Tender Heart and the Care Bears. And they'll be like, no. Oh. That's <laughs> okay. Everybody stand up right now and give yourself a big hug. Because you have to love yourself first. Now turn to the person to, on your left or your right and give them a big hug too. And, you know, it's, again, people, you know, like adults can connect and, you know, feel silly and have fun. And, you know, and it's through the power of cartoons. It's like, you know, I'm so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ah, Absolutely. It's a, it's a good thing. Yep. It sounds like your life has been blessed with many different opportunities and experiences through the course of your career. And uh, it's most fascinating to be able to share these moments with you. Yeah. No, thank you, man. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, like I say, it's, uh, I often feel like George Bailey and it's a wonderful life, you know, that oh, yeah. role that Jimmy Stewart played, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, he's the reason why I wanted to become a, an actor in film and TV in the first place, you know, um, happened upon that movie a long time ago. And I, I often have those moments where I go, wow, it, it really is, you know, a wonderful life. And, you know, a man or a woman who has friends and family, like, really, that's it right there, you know? I absolutely agree with you, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yep, no, absolutely, man. Well, you know, one of the shows you've been a part of that's another long-running, long-standing fan favorite is My Little Pony. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your pony, Soren, and what was he like to play? Yeah, Pony Soren, he's, he's um, I love that guy, because once again, you know, um, it was so neat. I, I got back from the Run for One Planet tour and, um, you know, the casting director here in Vancouver knows me for a long time because he actually directed me and Ed and Betty and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. And, you know, they were looking for his voice to play Soren, who's, you know, in, the description was he he's one of the Wonder Bolts, but he's, you know, he's he's an extreme athlete. He's, you know, he's he's super positive. He's super this. He's super that. And, you know, um, I remember Terry saying, like, I only know one guy in this whole city that will play this. So Maddie Hill, you need to come down here right now and read for this. And so, you know, came down and, and got the part. And um, I, again, it's great casting on their part in terms of like, it's easy for me to step into it because essentially I just get to be myself, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's awesome. You know, I think that's where I continually know that I'm on the right path because I'm, I'm getting to do stuff. I think that also reflects me authentically and, you know, so that I can then, put it out there and I think there's a reason why I'm not able to do these, you know, you know, these big monster voices and stuff. Cause I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I could, well, one, it makes me cough and I lose my voice. So, you know, and there's guys and gals that are 10,000 times more talented than me. And, you know, in terms of those vocal ranges, but, uh, you know, I always believe we, you know, we, uh, we're always taken care of by the good Lord above. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you on that as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. What kind of advice would you give to someone, Matt, who's looking at potentially joining the voiceover industry or trying to get into it? You know, it's such a great question, Trenton, because I think in that respect, it's really changed and evolved in the last few years. I mean, you know, obviously when I started when I was, you know, 13, there was pretty much just kind of, you know, one avenue. You needed to get an agent and your agent would send you out and you'd, you know, go in person and you'd read for things you get a couple of gigs, you put a demo together, whether it's film TV or whether it's voiceover, you know, and you kind of do the rounds that way. Whereas now technology is so brilliant because everybody's accepting MP3s from pretty much everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's a great time to get in. And I've always been a firm believer that there's always enough room for anybody. I think the, the universal is we always have to realize it's a unique path and there's no barrier of entry other than the one that we put in front of ourselves, you know, um, I, I truly, and I mean that with all my heart, it's, uh, I don't think it's any more or less easy or hard to get into the industry now than when it was 30 years ago. It's just different, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah. You know, so I'd say for, you know, like that advice was for me from, you know, Dorothy Boyce, my first agent, you know, even though it was for film and TV, she still said, she's like, you got to get some training. She's just like, I, you know, she's like, okay, I love your energy and your belief. And, you know, Michael J. Fox is the only other client I've ever said yes to without any auditions or you know, anything else. And you somehow remind me of him, she said, so you better make me proud. I remember her saying that, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's the same now. I think that everybody has got to be, they, it, it's not just saying, yeah, okay, I'm going to be a voice actor. Um, okay. That's awesome. Now, and then what's the next step? And what's the next step after that? And, you know, there's there's like no route um, other than the unique path that everybody forges. Absolutely. Everyone's path is different. Yeah. And I think the universal is definitely, you know, get trained. If you're if you're not very good, then get then get good. Get great. You know, don't be afraid to work your butt off, you know, and because that will produce results for sure, you know, and, you know, if you don't live in a city that's sort of like a major center, like say, you know, LA or Vancouver or like, I don't know, New York or, you know, um, Chicago, let's say, you know, 
I still think that with the advent of technology, it's a lot easier still to, you know, to, to break that barrier. You don't necessarily have to move to these cities in order to, to have some sort of a voice career. You know, you just got to be creative about it, right? Absolutely. I totally agree. You got to just be creative and put yourself out there any way you can. Well, exactly. You know, and, and it's like everything. It's like learning how to run a marathon or doing a voiceover and getting a career. It's practice, 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 you know, and only we can be responsible for that. Right. You know, and so if, if that's the first thing you got to do, well, then, okay, then, then do that. You know, there's get into a class, build a community, talk to people, phone your mom every day and say, mom, what do you think of this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on, moms will always love you. They'll always say like, oh, honey, you've got the best voices. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt. You've shared some amazing stories with us today, brother. I am so excited to have had you on the show. Do you have any other up-and-coming projects in the voiceover industry that you can share with us today? Yes, I do. Um, well, Super Noobs um, by the ultra-talented Scott Fellows, um, who I uh, did Johnny Quest for many years, and uh, I just did such a wonderful, talented human being. Um, he cast me in this show, I guess, what we're on season two now. And uh, that's, I think that's airing on Cartoon Network, actually, I think. Um, but, uh, and then Dino Trucks, which um, we're in the third season of 78 episodes. Um, and that's with Dreamworks Television, and it's on Netflix. And I play a resident dude named John John. So I'm the blue guy. <laughs> I've seen that show, and that's, I didn't realize that was you either. So that's awesome. <laughs> oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. know. I love playing. John John's one of my favorite, like, I love playing Ten Ten. <laughs> uh, well, that's it's, good. it's pretty cool. It's I've had those moments now where you know I've been say behind someone's kids and you know and, and they'll be watching Dino Trucks on Netflix and and uh, you know I'll walk up behind them and I'll wait till say it's a little scene with me in it or something and then you know I'll just like go, hey, what are you little dudes doing? You know, and they'll like all of a sudden they'll kind of look back and what the? and then we realize that they're all sort of talking <laughs> and uh, you know it's uh, it's so great. I get lots of. Lots of calls for people, you know, would, would I phone their kid on their birthday, you know, <laughs> and so, I mean, I've been doing that for like, third, like I said, 30 years. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, I mean, I still, I still get, uh, you know, Raphael requests, man. So, you know, if I, I could send you a picture, I've got a, I got an eight by 10 of me in my turtle suit. Oh, that'd be cool to see. I'd love to, to have a copy. <laughs> No, that's all good. I'll just mail, just give me your address. I'll mail one out to you. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. I'd appreciate it. Well, what I was going to ask was you'd kind of briefly talked about your run around uh, the United States and Canada and uh, you ministered to kids. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this, uh, this run was uh, actually an 11,000 mile run tour, all with the mission to inspire environmental action one step at a time. So we used the metaphor of the marathon, and myself and my friend, uh, Steph Tate, we formed an organization called Run for One Planet. Uh, and the, web, the website for that is runforoneplanet.org. And, uh, or you can get a link um, off of my website, Matt Hill, matt-hill.com. And uh, it literally was that. We ran a marathon each a day uh, around our, across our beautiful country up here in Canada, and then um, turned right and... Uh, went down the East coast, down to Florida and turned right again. And, you know, screwed Mexico in the bottom of the States and hit California, turned right again. And, uh, you know, just over 369 days later, we made it back to Vancouver and, uh, you know, it was, it absolutely changed my life. And for me, one of the greatest experiences I've, I've yet to experience, you know, and, uh, you know, not only because of my love of running, but also, you know, my dear love of the planet and, and really wanting to connect with a continent and see if we could just inspire everybody to take one action for a healthier planet. And that was really what the whole crux of the tour was all about, was asking people to just take one action. We have a list of 10 steps on our on our site of really easy things that people can do, you know. So, like, you know, if an environmental action for you is turning off the light when you leave a room or turning off the water when you're washing your hands or brushing your teeth, you know, it's little simple things like that, um, that literally we ran this message, you know, around North America and, uh, it was awesome. You know, I mean, it was, you know, again, like my dad used to say, whenever you, you know, throw yourself out there on a big dream, you get challenged just as large. So, you know, it, I mean, we could talk for an hour just about the tour, um, <laughs> but, it, but it truly was, you know, one of the, one of the greatest, uh, um, uh, things that I feel, um, really, really honored to have been the one to, to sort of go, Hey, 
I think I just really like to do this, you know. So absolutely. And uh, oh, and actually, just a, a, an update on on actually the tour. We got you know how in America you have the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yes. Well, in Canada we have what's called the Governor General, and um, we got a call actually uh, a couple of months ago. We've just been awarded uh, the Canadian version of the Medal of Honor, which is the uh, Governor General's Meritorious Service Medal. So we'll be We'll be going to a ceremony sometime in the fall and uh, getting uh, getting to shake the big guy's hand and and uh, you know for all the stuff with the tour and they said mainly because of all the kids that we talked to and you know the impact that it had on on North American kids. So well, that is most fascinating and what an honor! Congratulations on oh, that, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I tell you, it's um, one of those ones that came out of nowhere. You know, um, I, I never thought this something like this would happen, but. Uh, you know, again, it, it, it just shows, I believe, that we all have our path to follow and live, live our dreams and, you know, reach towards making ourselves better people and also, you know, connecting with more people and, you know, leaving a legacy of, of goodness, you know. Well, I think it's just spectacular that you were able to minister to so many people and, as you mentioned, kind of to, you know, spread a legacy of goodness, which is fantastic. You know, when you were contacted um, by the Canadian government, what was it like for them to tell you that you were going to be receiving this special award? For me, being awarded, say, this this medal for a job well done um, for something that we did like six years ago, just, it sh- again, it shows um, that we're always, it's, it's like the law of checks and balances. It always, you, you throw something great out there, something always great comes back. And it may not come back right away, but it comes back eventually and in ways that you're never expecting it, but it always turns out better than expected. You know, and for, say, the, you know, say this, this tour, you know, like I, like I was sharing with you, the second that I reached out big on this dream to inspire a continent, through running, I got the instant gift back of people saying thank you for making me laugh or helping me get through a tough childhood when, with all the cartoons. And so that's what I, what's what I mean. It was always always this give and take of you know people saying thank you, and I'm going, whoa, no, 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 thank you. Holy moly, you're just giving me the greatest gift here by sharing this with me, you know? You know, and then I think that's, to me, that's why we're all here put on this earth is, you know, for our, even because our time is relatively short, it's like, you know, make it great. And, and whatever that great is for you, it doesn't have to be my life. You don't want it to be my life. You want it to be your life, you know? And um, that's what I love about the power of choice because we have so much choice, you know? Um, I think probably the biggest thing is we always have a choice. Who are we going to be through every situation, you know? Um, and I think ultimately leaving a legacy of goodness, you know, so that, you know, it's like that, that, that my angel was saying, like people will, you know, they'll never remember what you said. They'll never remember what you did. They'll just remember how people, how you made people feel. You know, I, I, I love that one because, because that's the truth, I think. Most definitely. I totally agree. People are going to remember the good times yeah. and the funny things you did and the laughter you brought them from the joy of whatever it was that made them feel that way, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> Matt, thank you again, man, so much for sharing your stories with us today. One more time, what was your website and how can people reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. They, well, they can find me on Facebook if they want, um, or they can go to my website too. And that's Matt, uh, M-A-T-T dash H-I-L-L dot com. And, um, or the Run for One Planet website if you want to have a look at what, what I'm talking about with the tour. Uh, and that's run for one planet dot org. Well, you answered my last question without even having to ask it. And the question I usually ask to finish out is, what is the legacy you want to leave behind? But you shared such an amazing story with us, you know, about all the shows you've been a part of, but as well as, you know, helping people be aware of the planet and, you know, keep it clean and, you know, just being an individual that shows, you know, you're exercising and being healthy and taking care of the planet and, and ministering to children. And I think ministering to kids today is the best, the number one greatest thing you can ever do because our children are the next generation. And if we don't minister to them, if we don't share our love Mm -hmm. with them and what we know and try to help them see the path for their future, what other legacy is there, Matt? I mean, I think you have an amazing legacy that you're leaving behind and you will be remembered for a long, long time after you're gone, my man. Mm, well, thank you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, but it's true, right? It's like, you know, we, we take that on and, you know, I really, I really believe that, you know, it's, um, and I, because it's funny when you, when you say yes to that type of living, it does get you through the tough times, you know, because it doesn't mean I, you know, I've had just probably, I've had lots of tough days and I know you've probably had lots of tough days and what it does is I think it keeps us grounded to say like, okay, I'm part of this human journey, but at the same time, it allows you to go back to simplicity of going like, okay, what am I standing for? Who am I going to show up and be in this moment? You know, not live with rose colored glasses on, just say, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do in terms of like leaving a mark or here's what I want to stand up for right now. Or even something as, you know, minuscule as being in a Starbucks lineup and you see that the barista is having a really tough day because it's super busy and people are being grumpy with her or whatever, you know, my dad taught me that one. It's like, you know, he's like, kill them with kindness. Just like, just be good to each other, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that changes everything. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's like I say to the kids, it's like, be good to yourself first because you have to love yourself first and then, uh, you know, be good to everybody else and, and then be good to the planet. And, you know, then I think we've, we've done our job and, you know, hopefully seven generations forward, you know, are, are those great, 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 great grandkids go like, Hey, thanks a lot, grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Not grandpa, but great, 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 grandpa. I don't know how many seven generations is, but it's quite a few. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Matt, man, it has been an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on the show today, bud. Thanks, man. Thanks for asking me. I sure appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with uh, with everything. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. You got it, dude. Matt, thank you so very much for being on the show today. It was an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you just give us a closeout today as Raphael? Hey, yo, 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 everybody. Trenton, rock star. Dude, dudes and dudettes out there, be good to yourself, be good to each other, be good to this planet. I tell you, we got this. So uh, it's been a pleasure being on Who Did That Voice? And my friend Tender Heart would also just like to say thank you, Trenton, for allowing me to share um, as well. Oh, oh. And um, Ed would like to tell everybody, too, that uh, don't forget to be sparkly and um, uh, um, fun and good to everyone. And remember, um, uh, eat lots of gravy as well. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Matt Hill, the voice of so many amazing characters that we covered today. We'll see you guys next year for another episode of Who Did That Voice? Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode and for the rest of this year. We'll see you guys next year on January 6th with special guest Kerrigan Mahan, the voice of Goldar from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Hey everyone, it's been an amazing 2016 and we couldn't have gotten here without you. I hope everyone has a happy new year and we'll see you in 2017. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.